the graduation address. This now gives us the opportunity to hear from a distinguished member of our alumni community. And we are very pleased and fortunate today that the address will be delivered by Ms. Maria Demopoulos. Ms. Demopoulos is the Special Advisor, Multicultural Communities for the Department of Justice and the Community Safety within Victoria. Internationally recognised as an expert specialising in diversity, gender and the law, Maria has extensive experience in policy formulation in government, research and community education. In 2008, she was appointed by the federal government to the National Council to reduce violence against women and their children. She has completed a Bachelor of Arts with honours and a Bachelor of Laws from Monash University. She was appointed a member of the Order of, of Australia for significant service to women, to cultural diversity and to the prevention of domestic violence. I have great pleasure in now inviting Ms Maria Demopoulos to deliver the graduation address. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we, well, I stand today and pay my respects to Indigenous elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty was ne has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I also want to recognise the past atrocities against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people of this land and that Australia was founded on the genocide and dispossession of First Nations people. I acknowledge that colonial structures and policies still remain in place today and recognise the ongoing struggles of the First Nations people in dismantling those structures. The struggle to seek justice, to remember and address this nation's past is ongoing and in my view, an absolutely necessary requirement for individual and collective healing processes. Importantly, I believe that we can walk together to make a better future, which guides my work as a proud member of Reconciliation Victoria. I'd also like to acknowledge Deputy Chancellor, the Honourable Peter Young, Senior Vice Provost and Vice Provost Research, Professor Rebecca Brown, Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Professor Rita Wilson, members of the faculty, ladies and gentlemen, and especially the new graduates. I wanna know how you keep your hat on. <laughs> it keeps falling off. I think they've overestimated the size of my head. Thank you so much for inviting me here to address. What an absolute privilege it is to be able to be here with you, all new graduates, who undoubtedly have had some challenges over the uh, last few years, challenges that no doubt you faced before the pandemic, balancing work, of course, school, family lives and so on, only to find they were further compounded by a global health crisis. In 2020, COVID-19 touched our lives in nearly every way and everywhere as countries like ours went into lockdown and restricted movement to contain the spread of the virus. 2020 is a year none of us will ever forget and what a year for you to be graduating. An age when terms like lockdown, Zoom, you're on mute and new norm became the lexicon of the day. And of course, one year into COVID-19 pandemic, the world has seen and sadly continues to see death, economic hardship and anxiety on an unprecedented scale. But it's also witnessed acts of extraordinary courage, resilience and perseverance. And I think your presence here today so loudly demonstrates this Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> uh, 
Now, I, I was asked to share some learnings or insights, some advice I was asked. Now, that always makes me feel a little bit nervous because I think it was Ellen DeGeneres who once said, don't give advice, it'll come back and bite you on the butt. Don't take anyone's advice, she said. So my advice to you is be true to yourself and everything will be fine. The irony, of course, is that I am currently a senior advisor within the Department of Justice with three ministers that I advise, handing out lots of advice, and most certainly I'm expecting it to come back and bite me very soon. But for what it's worth, here I go. Let me start with a quote of one of my most favourite authors, Miss Angela Davis, an activist and an incredible human being. And she says, I'm no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I'm changing the things I cannot accept. I'm drawn to this quote because it so succinctly expresses what has driven me throughout my life. I hope that in sharing some of my experiences and insights, I can impart to you the most important of lessons for me as embodied by Angela Davis. Do not be deterred by thinking you have no control. Go out and change the things that require change. Rather than being distracted by what you do not control, think about what you can influence and how that ultimately impacts on what you control and influence going forward. I arrived in Australia with my parents and siblings from the northern part of Greece. Kalimera, Tikanete. Good, thanks. Any of you remember Effie? You're perhaps not that old. At the age of six, and grew up in Geelong at a time when there were very few Greek families, but one of the best football teams in Australia. Starting school in a new country where the education system was not yet equipped to embrace migrant communities was certainly a challenge. I spoke no English and looked very different to the other children around me. There were no ESL classes to help the transition into school back then and the environment didn't feel particularly welcoming. My brother and I were isolated from the other children, often by the teachers themselves, and would spend our evenings and weekends reading. And my goodness, did we read. In fact, we both went on to win numerous reading competitions Unfortunately, though, the ugly face of racism was a daily feature of my early school years. I decided at the age of eight or nine that I was either going to respond to racism in a way that allowed it to fester and defeat me, or I was going to prove that I'm not who they said I was. Those harmful comments and behaviours actually drove me in ways that I probably wasn't necessarily aware of at the time. Now, as the children of migrants, we were constantly reminded of the importance of education and firmly provided with two options. You can either choose to be a doctor or a lawyer. And I'm sure some of you can really relate. The lure of a large income undoubtedly driving those binary options on behalf of my parents. Well, folks, I chose law. Motivated largely, I thought, by an idealistic instinct for justice. And I ended up doing a combined arts law degree at this wonderful institution during the 1980s. What a different time it was back then. For starters, I was the product of free education. And the small calf that used to exist in a building called the Union Building seemed to constantly emit certain odours and where the quality of food provided at the grill was the most pressing of injustices. I did indeed emerge with an arts law degree, only to realise that my parents' expectations that I would practise law wasn't one that I wished to realise. Much to the disgrace of my mother, who still asks me to this very day, why don't you have an office in Collins Street like your cousins do? So insight number one, the degree you end up with does not necessarily determine the professional pathway you embark on. 
to quote the great Toni Morrison, the Nobel Prize winning writer, who during her address to college graduates asked the grads to create their own narrative. She said, you are your own stories and therefore free to imagine and experience what it means to be humans without wealth, what it feels like to be humans without domination over others, without reckless arrogance, without fear of others unlike you, without rotating, rehearsing and reinventing the hatreds you learned in the sandbox. So doing arts law has given me an incredible opportunity to acquire the kind of knowledge and skills to develop the critical thinking that became fundamental in my professional journey. Learning how to think, in my view, is the true essence of education. To quote Martin Luther King, education must also train one for quick, resolute and effective thinking. To think incisively and to think for oneself is very difficult. We are prone to let our mental life become invaded by legions of half-truths, prejudices and propaganda. And I did emerge from my studies profoundly impacted by the evidence of injustice, unfairness, and yet somehow I still determined that the law could provide a framework for social change. After graduating, I worked as a community lawyer at the Federation of Community Legal Services before travelling north to work with First Nations communities. And that was when my passion for human rights and social justice really emerged. That was when I finally encountered the truth of the history of this country. And it is embarrassing to say that I was 22 before I really truly appreciated and acknowledged the role that the Western legal system has been and continues to be used to disempower First Nations people. I also came to painfully learn that as a migrant woman, much of my privilege had been gained at the expense of First Nations people. First and second generation Australians have much to reflect on and unlearn when it comes to First Nations. The process starts with confronting our privilege as multicultural Australians and recognise that we have unfinished business. And I'm very proud that it is our Victorian government that has instituted a process for truth telling in this country. It's why I decided that so much of my activism would be dedicated to supporting treaty and supporting truth telling. From walking with incredible leaders like Patrick Dodson, Dr Jackie Huggins, Nova Paris, Marcia Langton and so many others over the Sydney Harbour Bridge 20 years ago. Or more recently, working with the first national accord between all peak national multicultural organisations and the National Congress on Indigenous Rights. Lesson number two, taking a stand comes at a cost. But as Arundhati Roy has said, and I quote, a thing once seen cannot be unseen. And when you have seen a great moral crime, to remain silent is as much a political act as it is to speak against. I found myself in a refugee camp in Kakuma on the border of South Sudan and Kenya, working for the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. It was there whilst we, the workers, were enclosed in compounds at night, safe, that we could hear the screams at night, whilst food parcels were dropped to starving masses outside of that camp. That shaped my absolute commitment to ensuring that refugee and humanitarian entrants are treated with dignity and are not illegal immigrants. When I returned to Victoria, I ended up working, having seen gender-based violence at a global scale, I ended up working in issues around family and domestic violence. It was there that I began to meet people like Phil Cleary, Rosie Batty, many others who had confronted the murder of a loved one 
in the name of so-called family and love. Together with others, I co-authored a book called Blood on Whose Hands, based on the learnings that sadly have yet to be taken up as we see at least one to two women and children murdered in this country every week. It was a period where my passion for law reform and action on family and domestic violence emerged, culminating in my appointment to the National Council to reduce violence against women and children by the then Rudd Gillard government. So it seems that professionally I ended up embracing a number of different parallel areas of work, whether it was anti-racism, anti-discrimination or the rights of refugees and First Nations people, or addressing the impact of violence on women and children, it was about human rights. Ultimately, my work has taken me around the world where I've lived and worked in over 28 different countries. Working closely with peak NGOs, a stint at UN Women in New York, that was pretty cool, and also UNHCR in Geneva, and it's true what they say about the chocolate, and numerous collaborations around the world with the most amazingly inspiring individuals and communities. It made me realise that making change includes seeing ourselves, all of us, as citizens not only of a community or a country, but of the world. I met Amal Clooney, who I remember saying, think about your life from the end looking back. What do you want to be remembered for? Make sure you have a good story. So I hope in sharing some of the insights that you might also agree that the journey for me since graduating many, many years ago was not one that was somehow predetermined by the type of degree that I obtained, but rather one based on the lessons learned at this institution, the relationships that I developed, the incredible lectures, lecturers who inspired us with stories of possibilities. Because I've realised that you're not going to get very far in life simply based on what you already know. You're going to advance in life by, by what you're going to learn after you leave here today. Because learning is indeed a treasure that accompanies us everywhere. But you do need an open heart and an open mind. And I don't need to tell you that there will be many, many obstacles. Efforts to bring about change are undoubtedly fraught with so many barriers along the way. You will undoubtedly, as I did, it's just the way things are. But back to that Angela Davis quote at the beginning of my address, it's critically important that you realise that so many of the entrenched behaviours, policies, practices in our societies are based on a whole set of false stories we tell ourselves. Self-sabotaging, oppressive narratives that hold us back, that help to maintain the status quo and create a fearful and hesitant attitude to those not like us. As Nelson Mandela once said, diversity is us, it's not them. So, break free of the lenses that limit you, is what I have as a mantra every day. Whilst the issues impacting on your future are vast and significant have made reference to, such as climate change, the impact, of course, of this pandemic, so much incredible potential exists in this room. As I watched everyone come to the stage, the diversity, the hope, the knowledge, the wisdom makes me extremely excited. Obama recently stated, you've got more role models, more roadmaps, more resources than the civil rights generation did. You've got more tools, technology and talents than my generation did. And no generation, you, has been better positioned to be warriors of justice and to remake this world. So I implore you, raise awareness about the inequities as much as the equities. Mobilise action. Press our leaders to do more. Speak truth to power, even when silence is demanded of you. Call out the hypocrisies and negative actions of governments. Provoke, 
prod the status quo, but most importantly, use your knowledge and learnings to tell the world what it is we need to heal. Be inspired by those who have defended our human rights in the past, just as we continue to be inspired by those in our present. And if anybody wants to write a PhD about how to keep this cap on, I'll be very, very open to it. Look, to, I think that uh, together we can be a collective force for the defence and promotion of human rights and humanity. I will never forget sitting in the International Criminal Court in The Hague back in the early 1990s, I think it might have been, and listening to a country that had been accused of gross invasion of human rights of its children, only to have that government and say those children with disability were subhuman. That cannot continue to be put forward as a, as a defence to undermining anybody's humanity. Finally, because I know I've probably gone well and truly over time, I am Greek, I did warn them, I like to talk. <laughs> Megan Rapinoe, the great soccer player, she says, I know firsthand the power of a movement led by and for the next generation. You, my good friends out there, are the next generation. Take, take control, leave your mark, put your stake in the ground and build the future that you want together. Believe in it, she says, and fight like hell to do it. Thank you for your time, folks. I also need to tell the, uh, the group over here it's culturally appropriate to pin money on this gown as I leave the stage. But <laughs> look, uh, thank you so much. Congratulations. What an incredible achievement. <laughs>